the evening flow, um, and I had helped facilitate one of your other meetings, and um, some of you, I think, felt I was pretty scripted, um, not meaning to be, but in order to make sure that we make best use of our time. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we start off with the ability to, as Supervisor Hudgens said, to make sure that we have some baseline information. Over the many weeks and many months of this process, uh, a great many questions and comments have been um, given to county staff. And so county staff had, um, when we were talking about how to run this meeting, I said, what if you were able to answer some of these um, burning concerns or burning questions? So the first part of this your evening will be, um, we have some questions that reflect your concerns. And I'm going to ask these questions to a few of our panelists. And when I do, I would like very much to ask you to please listen to the question and then to please listen to the answer. You can go along and refer to your handouts. But I would ask please that we do not have shout outs or interruptions while the question is being answered. And the reason being is that this is being taped. And those people who are in the lecture hall and those people who might be at home viewing us, I would really like to have them have the ability to hear, all right? So we will have a few of these questions. You will get answers. And then the rest of the evening is open mic. It's an open forum, okay? We have a microphone that will be turned on, and you will have, after the questions, if you have um, questions you need clarified, then you will be invited to come up to the mic and ask those questions. When you come up to the mic, I would really appreciate, um, in interest of and respect of all of your um, fellow residents, that when you ask your question for clarification, that it is clear and concise. So I'm not going to want to have to give you the hook to get off the stage, but I would like to have as many people to have the ability to ask questions. Okay, 9.25, closing remarks, next steps. So, in interest of that, I'd like to go ahead and ask uh, the first set of questions, okay? All right. I need my glasses. Thank you, So, the first question is being directed to Kathy Belgian. I'm gonna make sure she has her water. It's very hot, all right. We have asked custodial staff regarding the area of the AC. So it is on now, so given the uh, the amount of people, it will take a while to cool down. Okay. All right. So Kathy, Kathy is with um, the zoning administration. All right. So this is a kind of this is actually a three-part question. Okay. All right. Here we go. Why is the county proposing to allow for increased residential density in Reston, and why now? The second part is. What would this zoning ordinance amendment actually do? And why are we doing this? Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, again, I'm Kathy Belgian, and uh, it's apparently not only um, baby boomers that need to wear their reading glasses on the gym extra, and I need them now too. So. <laughs> Uh, the proposed zoning ordinance amendment that we're here to discuss today is actually very narrow in scope. Um, the proposal is to uh, address a regulatory change which is needed to support the future implementation of the Reston Master Plan over a time frame of the next 40 years. 
Um, we have known this isn't a new um, thing that suddenly became needed. Uh, the need has been something that staff has anticipated for uh, over 10 years now, even prior to the comprehensive plan being amended in anticipation of Metro. In the 50 plus years uh, since the inception of Reston, we have gradually been approaching the existing residential density limitation that's contained in the PRC zoning district of 13 persons per acre. And again, that was established in conjunction with the original plan for Reston. Um, and again, we have a revised plan based on uh, new and projected development, and so this is uh, needed in order to bring that uh, into the future and the ability to do so. What we're proposing uh, with this amendment is not a rezoning. It would not change the zoning designation of any properties in Reston, um, and it would not approve any new dwellings. It's not a proposal to add the dwellings or the people uh, that you may have heard about. Any proposed development going forward is still subject to the standard development review process. This won't change any of that. In the meetings that we've had uh, leading up to today, uh, since we've been talking about this amendment, um, and through your emails and other means of communication. We have heard uh, from you all that there is a uh, concern that we take into consideration all of one rest in, or, or one rest in as we've heard it referred to. Um, and we recognize that this is important, um, and we've heard you, and to be clear, all of Reston is accounted for in what's proposed uh, over time in the Reston Master Plan. All parts of Reston are, are part of that plan. This particular zoning ordinance amendment, however, only deals with the zoning district, uh, the portion of rest of its zone PRC. And if you refer to the map that we have over here, the PRZ zone section, the PRC zone sections are all of the yellow areas. Um, and there's only a portion of that that's located within the transit station area. The rest of the purple area is not zone PRC. But again, we recognize that development in Reston has an impact on all of it, and we heard you there. Um, the two regulatory changes that we're proposing are, a, we are seeking to increase the 13 persons per acre maximum density that we spoke of, and we will be recommending a number somewhere between 13 and as high as 16 persons per acre. And the reason, we've had a lot of questions and concerns about the number of the 16. The reason that 16 is the, the upper limit of the range that we're considering uh, is because all the areas in Reston where the plan uh, allows for potential future growth are being considered. So that's not just the areas in the transit station area, but the village centers which have already built into them the ability to potentially redevelop in the future, that was taken into consideration. But we, again, we've heard the concerns about that. Um, in addition to the public meetings we've had, um, we have met with some of your uh, community representatives on a smaller uh, scale basis. And we recognize there's a great deal of concern about the possibility of it going as high as 16. So we've heard you and we are gonna take various options into consideration before we make a recommendation. In addition, in addition to the overall 13 persons per acre, um, there's a second component of the proposal, which is to allow very uh, limited areas uh, which are zone PRC and also located in the transit station areas, um, which have comprehensive plan language which may anticipate uh, development of high density residential development in excess of 30 of, excuse me, 50, 50 dwelling units per acre. 50 dwelling units per acre is currently the limit in high density residential areas. And we're not proposing to change that for the great majority of the PRC district. There are a very few uh, number of properties that this would affect, um, but we are looking to give the Board of Supervisors the option of considering applications. Again, this wouldn't be a blanket approval. This would allow the Board to consider applications for just those limited properties that meet those criteria if, if the Board felt that that was appropriate. We've also heard your feedback um, and your concern with that proposal as well. And there were a number of folks that suggested that having that be left open-ended without an upper limit was a great concern. Uh, so based on your feedback, we are proposing to add an option for the board to consider to limit those um, 
properties with the additional adoption uh, to a maximum of say 70 to 75 dwelling units per acre. So it wouldn't be open-ended. <coughs> so to summarize, we have, we have heard you. We do recognize that Reston, uh, all of Reston is one community. Um, we want to clarify that the proposed amendment, while we understand it affects all of Reston, um, it's only uh, a, a change to the PRC regulations, and I do see your, your feedback. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but again, the proposed amendment does not rezone or change the plan for any of Reston, um, and it would not authorize any new development. So it's a two-part regulatory change that's proposed, uh, which would allow future development in accordance with the plan over the next 40 years to be considered. Um, and citizen concerns will be taken into account and are actively being taken into account before we make our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder that you will have a chance to ask clarifying questions after our, we get through some of this baseline information. Kathy, thank you very much. Take a drink of water. Okay. So the next question. So the next question is for Fred Selden, who is the director of Department of Planning and Zoning. So Fred, can you provide some background on the rest of the plan update? Is this better? Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to provide some background on the master plan uh, that was updated based on a process that started in 2009. Some of you were invited to what was called the Landry's College that was actually held in this room where we talked about the process of planning, zoning, what it meant. Um, we tried to provide information on the PRC district and how it was unique to the planned community of Reston, as well as two other planned communities, uh, Cardinal Forest and Burke Center. So, that zoning district was predicated on a master plan for Reston. That master plan, when it was developed, was, the, in some respects, you could call it the property of the master developer. It was the developer's plan. It was started, it was created and adopted in 1962. There were numerous updates through 1989. After that, there was no longer really a master developer of Reston. It started out with Reston Land and became Gulf Reston. I believe the last entity that we considered to be the master developer was Terrible, that was involved in the redevelopment and built out of the town center. That plan, when you look at it, the area along the corridor, where a lot of focus of growth is now by a current plan focuses growth around the transit station. The only thing that plan called for that area was industrial. And industrial zoning at the time in the 1960s allowed office. We don't think that it was contemplated that that area would develop in industrial uses, but it clearly was contemplated that it developed in office, research and development types of uses. Residential was not contemplated nor planned, nor was retail. If you look at that area, there are very few opportunities for retail and there are very few opportunities for residential outside of the town center. The town center portion of that corridor to the north did allow residential development. But that plan, we updated it first in the early 2000s where we came up when Metro was being planned in the corridor and we had knowledge of where those stations would be. We replanned the corridor and we called it the Reston Herndon Suburban Center. And it was planned separate from the rest of Reston. The rest of Reston was left under the old, call it 1989 plan. And we replanned the area for the transit station areas. When we started this process in 2009, that update, there was a clear community consensus that they wanted the areas to be brought together, that they wanted the planning for the, what we call the transit station areas in the corridor to be integrated with the plan for the rest of Reston. And that process was divided into two phases. The 
The first phase started in 2010 and was concluded with an adopted plan in 2014 that planned the transit station areas, Herndon, Wheeling, and the Reston Town Center. The remaining areas of Reston, primarily the village centers, an area that is north of Baron Cameron that was a part of the town center that quite frankly, I don't think anybody thought that it bore much relationship to the town center. This is the area of the Home Depot, uh, there's a silver diner, a Trader Joe's, uh, other assorted retail uses. But that area under the old 89 plan was part of the town center. That area was replanned in the plan that was adopted in 2015, which was the village centers and that area which we call the Baron Cameron retail area. The residential communities of Reston were actually what we would call down plan because they had been built. If you look at the old plan for Reston, there was a lot of flexibility as to how to build out the residential neighborhoods. So low density residential, could, you could have townhouses or single family. Medium density, you could have townhouses, single family, multifamily. So you could have a wide variety of residential uses that could occur in the neighborhoods of Reston. Our plan that was adopted in 2015, there are uh, something on the order of eight or nine different residential categories. And it's meant to reflect what's been built. Because one of the things that you don't want to have is a plan that suggests that you might be able to put multifamily housing in a place where they're currently today single family homes. So most of, almost all of the neighborhoods of Reston the plan was down plan. Most of the multifamily areas, which were high density residential under the old plan, almost all of the garden apartment areas were planned for high density residential. Those were planned to medium density to reflect the garden apartments that are there today. So in terms of development potential, most of those garden apartment complexes, the development potential under the new adopted plan went down did not go up. The village centers, we kept the residential development, we kept the high density designation for the village center, which kept the residential potential for the village center. And that was very important because one of the things that we heard loud and clear when we were, when we were updating the plan, and one of the biggest proponents of it was Robert Simon himself, who said that the village centers really lacked a sense of cohesion. He thought that Lake Ann was really the only village center that tried to function and emulated kind of what he wanted to have happen in the village centers. So he desperately wanted, going forward, to have the opportunity to look at these village centers differently because most of them, quite frankly, are just shopping centers. And he wanted it, he thought that they could be something better than a shopping center. So that's why when, when we were asked, what is the residential potential for these village centers, we took the 50 deeds per acre and we multiplied that time the area of the village centers and that's what you see on the chart that's on the, on the, um, against the wall. But again, we didn't bring those units to Repton. Those units were already in the plan for Repton. What we did was for the village centers, we retained them. For other areas, we didn't. And there's one exception, and that's St. John Woods. And the reason that's an exception is they came in during the process and submitted a nomination for consideration when we were adopting the plan. They were planned previously for high density residential, and they came in with a nomination to retain that high density residential designation. It's the only garden apartment complex that did so. But again, it wasn't added, it was retained. The plan for Reston, and again, it was a five-year planning effort, but it emphasized that the development should occur, that there should be mixed-use, high-density development by the transit stations. It's a way to optimize the transit. It's a way to change those areas Quite frankly, most of those areas today are just office parks. 
it changes them into something different. And that something different can be a benefit to the wider community in terms of providing retail, in terms of providing places where people might want to be. Um, and that was, that's the gist of the planning process that we went through. Uh, again, I want to clarify because sometimes people who were involved in that process have come to me and said, hey, you changed your plan for the village center. No, we haven't. When we put residential numbers there, it doesn't mean that the plan has changed at all. That's just our estimate of how many new residential development new units could occur in the village centers. The plan for those village centers still requires a plan that works with the community. It's very explicit to say, if you want to redevelop one of those village centers, you have to work with the community, you have to come up with a plan, that does things like has a plaza, has a gathering space, creates an, a hub of activity, transforms it into something other than the shopping center that it is today. Um, so again, our focus with this, with this plan amendment and the zoning ordinance amendment is actually to have a tool to implement the plan. Because, as Kathy just said, the PRC zoning district has these zoning maximums in there. And quite frankly, they were set out initially for a population of about 70 to 80,000 people. That's what they thought would be when they planned and rested. Go back to the 62 plan, it says right on it, a population of 78,000 people. So that's what they contemplated Reston to be. They, they did not contemplate a Reston with three transit station areas. They did not contemplate a restaurant that, quite frankly, has been a club for corporate entities and headquarter office buildings. They thought it would be low-density R&D office buildings along the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, again, I will have a chance to ask clarifying questions. So, the next. Uh, question we have is for Andrea Dorlester. And Andrea is a manager of park planning uh, for our park authority. So Andrea, your question is this. How does the county evaluate possible impacts of new development on parks and recreation resident? What is expected of developers? Thank you, Ellen. Um, the Park Authority has staff that participate in the development review process right along with planning and zoning and transportation and public works and environmental services. And what we use as our guide is the comprehensive plan. This green sheet of paper that you picked up before you came in is a summary of the essential key points of what the comprehensive plan says about parks and recreation in Reston. Um, rest in why any new development should take into consideration impacts of that development on parks and recreation. It's a little bit different depending on whether the development is taking place in a transit station area, a village center, or elsewhere in the wider Preston area. And all that information is here on the green sheet. What I will tell you is that park staff has a seat at the table when the county is reviewing every rezoning application in Reston. And we use the comprehensive plan language as a guide, and we want to make sure that every new development creates new parks and builds new recreational facilities and provides funding for the kinds of parks and recreation that they cannot build on site within their developments to be provided in the Reston area. I like to keep it short and sweet. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions when we get to that, that part of the program. Great. Andrew, thank you very much. All right. Our last question is for Kristen Calkins. And Kristen is with our Department of Transportation. You ready, Kristen? Okay. No dry mouth here. We're in good shape? Okay. With the increase in land use recommended in the comprehensive plan, how are the transportation needs associated with the increased density being addressed? Thank you, Kristen. Um, 
name is Ellen. Um, I am a long-range transportation planner with the Department of Transportation. Um, and we've been working on a lot of the needs associated with transportation relevant to specifically the increased density of the three metro rail stations that are planned to come to us. Sorry to hear you. Um, I'll talk louder. It's usually not a problem. Um, so the rest of the master plan identified a significant need in transportation improvements, um, including crossings of the toll road, widenings, the grid of street, and also new and better improvements to just the areas surrounding the metro stations to be able to be able to walk and bike to them. Okay, really bad reverb on this one. Um, the board also recognized that there's a significant need for transportation associated with the metro. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh, yeah. uh, um, with the, we get. <laughs> so, as part of the adoption of the uh, phase one master plan, the board directed staff to do two separate things. One was to do a more detailed analysis of the grid of streets surrounding the metro rail stations to really understand what transportation improvements were needed to support that development. And the second was to create a funding plan to lay out a framework for how to do the funding for not only the grid of streets, but the larger transportation improvements associated with the master plan. Uh, staff has been working on both of those plans for the last few years. Uh, the rest of the funding plan has been adopted and endorsed by the Board of Supervisors. It creates a framework for how to fund and create a path forward for those improvements. Those improvements were also prioritized and understood greater by the network analysis. The network analysis focused on making sure that the grid of streets would be able to accommodate the new trips that would be made in the TSAs, as well as looked at making sure that the crossings were serving the trips going from north and south of the Dulles Toll Road, and really focused not only on the TSAs, but we had a larger study area. And there are a significant number of improvements associated with the Preston Master Plan. And you all know about the three crossings, Soapstone, South Lakes, Town Center. There's an interchange plant at Fairfax County Park on Sun Rides Valley Drive. A couple of roadway widenings on uh, Fox Mill, Monroe, all of them are kind of bulleted out on the white sheet. Uh, but we know where we're working towards, and with the funding plan, we now have kind of a path and a framework forward. Um, the funding plan also established an advisory group that's going to be working with the service district. I think they have a meeting coming up at the end of the month that really is going to help guide the um, implementation moving forward of transportation improvements in Preston. Um, we're also starting to make headway on some of those specific transportation improvements. Um, BDOT is currently working on the routing, widening of Route 7 from Ruston to Tyson's, which is going to provide a significant amount of mobility and improvement in that corridor. There is a public hearing for the Soapstone Connector on November 8th for the environmental assessment that's going to allow the department to take the next steps forward on the Soapstone project. Transportation projects are really big. They do take time. And the fact that we're moving forward on these means that we're making progress. Um, there have been a significant number of bike and ped projects that are being implemented as part of the access to the metro stations that was identified in the Metro Preston Metro Rail Access um, Group work that happened a while ago. Um, we also, as part of the Silver Line construction, put basically support structures under the Metro Rail Lines to make sure that when we're ready to build the town center, extension that we're able to do that. So we're front loading some of the work to make sure that in the future we have the ability. There's there's a lot. There's a lot going on in transportation in Reston. Um, and we have a lot of staff members that are working on it. Um, ongoing, it's a big department. There's lots of different things. Much like Andy mentioned, for parks, we have people at the table at every rezoning looking at the transportation impacts associated with those developments. We have bike head planners who are making sure that we're providing and planning for adequate and bike crossings, as well as our connector services that are really focused on getting people to and from the Metro Rail. Thank you, Kristen. Um, now, the forum is yours. We have a microphone. Given the uh, number of folks in, in, the, in this room, 
and how the how the chairs are just kind of extended this way. You have the microphone here for safety and that be able to access this, so we'll make sure that it's turned on. I would invite uh, those who have um, you need clarification on any of these answers, anything else that might be of concern with you. I invite those who have perhaps new to the process, um, you're not quite sure what might this be all about, um, and those who have not maybe spoken um, in these types of forums, to please feel free to come out. So, um, my thought is, is that you form a line um, just please be careful, nobody trips over the mic. And, um, and if there is a particular person you'd like to address the, the comments to, please feel free. Okay? So, is it on? I have about five questions, but I know I'm only allowed one, so I have to pick which one. You mentioned something about Robert Simon's, um, his desire to have um, community, and that Lake Ann was, about, was the only one that has a sense of community. I want to know, um, how is raising the density going to make the village centers more communal if the actual landscape doesn't change? Um, aren't you just proposing more multi-level high-rises for these areas? And multi-level high-rises, do they really um, add to community? No. It's contemplated that the village centers would redevelop, and that when they redevelop, they would change the form. It could be with higher buildings. It could be with multiple uses. Right now, you have strip shopping centers, one-story grocery stores. There are places in this region where multifamily housing is now on top of a grocery store. Uh, it tends to put people closer when you have pedestrian activity. One of the things that traditional shopping centers tend to facilitate is people driving to a grocery store, parking, and then leaving. There's nothing that really captures them or captures the activity. And I believe that that's one of the things that was contemplated. And again, when you look at how Lake Ann was originally set up, it had a grocery store on the, under a building that was housing above it. And it had high-rise buildings, good mid-rise buildings, good townhouses. You can have a mix of unit types. There's nothing that defines that it has to be one thing or the other. But I think what is key is, it's not just the form, but the function. A lot of times people just focus on the kind of what it is, but not how it will, the form of it and how it functions. And again, one of the things that we, we hope will happen in the future as these areas be developed is that they will function differently than they function today. And one of the things about having some kind of plaza or gathering space is a way to capture people so that they stay there and they just don't come, do their shopping, and leave. So, if I may follow up, you are saying, you're stating that these areas will be redeveloped. Is that correct? That's, that's what's contemplated. Redeveloped under a plan that is, that is proposed. So does that mean tearing down existing structures to, to build higher density? Well, again, the density is set at 50 DUs per acre. It could be that, but it could also be that you have a lot of surface parking where you could have some additional development on the surface parking. There are any number of ways that it can happen, and it's not for us to prescribe that. But again, I would... I think that's probably up to the developers, right? Well, the one thing I will say is, 
this Western community was developed by the Bible. Yes, it was. It's right. It was developed uh, by a, in accordance with a, plan. a master plan <laughs> right. that was agreed to yeah. and that was well thought out. And, and as I said earlier, that master plan was very, very flexible. And I would ask anybody to look at how flexible that plan was and, and how much ability the master developer had to make choices. And those choices were everything from the type of unit to the density. That's what scares me. We're giving the developers the choices. Thank you. Uh, so I heard five different for Paul, five different presentations from five different departments. More, I, a lot of the language I didn't quite understand because there's a lot of technical terms in terms of zoning. I'm fairly new to this process. I'm not a member of any organized group, but I'm wearing yellow because I'm concerned about the community that I've lived in since 1984. Having said that, the first question that was asked was, why this and why now? And then the last person who spoke talked about transportation. I drive to the Willie Avenue Metro Station every day from around Lake Ann. The thing that concerns me is, if I leave my house after 8 o'clock in the morning, it takes me 20 minutes to drive from North Shore Drive to the Colbert. But the appropriate question is, why this, why now? Why is the transportation part, we have plans and we have frameworks and we have designs and we have ideas, but nobody's actually proposed a way to fund anything or a timeline. It's going to be two years before the uh, uh, metro is complete to Loudoun County. And before then, a lot of these things could be built, and yet we have no timeline for improvements in the transportation system that's already overloaded. So may I just remind you that we are being taped and those who are in their homes trying to view, they are not going to be able to hear the questions in the answers. So, so could we, this gentleman, we need to answer his questions. So please, I just ask you to be mindful of that. Thank you. So we have been planning because it takes a plan to implement something. Um, as I mentioned, the Reston Funding Plan did create a framework for how to uh, fund all of the long-term projects that are associated with the Reston Master Plan. Um, I believe that on November 30th, the advisory group for the service district that was established and is going to be kind of the advisory community group that uh, has a lot of different representation from different groups in Reston is meeting. And that is going to be the, the vehicle that the county helped set priorities with the community. The rest of network analysis did kind of establish a high level framework of what those priorities are. Obviously, Soapstone is our number one right now. It's going to a public hearing for its environmental assessment on November 8th. Transportation projects are big. They do take time. I know that's, that's hard. It, we would love to be able to move projects faster. But we are working on them. We have so many staff dedicated to working on rest and specific projects. And I appreciate your concerns and we're very aware of them and we're working with the best of our abilities to make sure that we are implementing the projects that have been identified. So, so the answer is we don't know when. I mean, don't know how it's going to be paid for. So that goes back to the first question, why this, why now? Yes. Why this, why now? Because we haven't figured out the transportation piece, how to pay for it or when it's going to be done. I'm sorry, but that's kind of the question that I ask. Why this, why now, when that's the answer on transportation? general rule, it's very difficult, and in fact, the way land use and transportation ownership in terms of 
VDOT going in the roads, development isn't typically able to anticipate, well, okay, so you, you typically cannot, give me a chance, give me a chance. Development is paid for in large part by new development and is justified by new development. So the, the way the process works is that to have the road projects get on the books is because they are needed because of development. are about the master plan. You handed out that lovely green sheet, and the master plan involves tree canopies, open spaces, adequate parking. Those are all talked about in the master plan. And um, my concern, when we, when we don't follow the master plan, we allow everything to go downhill, and it, um, it uh, demeans the whole area. My concern is the exceptions to the master plan. Uh, one exception was for less, fewer than one space per unit. And when I, in the future, I would like to see the tree canopies remain, which are in the master plan. The open spaces, which offset the um, density and parking, spaces so that we don't have a problem. And I'd like your comments on um, how we can avoid making all those exceptions. Or, I, or my advice is not to make exceptions, but what are your comments? So my exact your question, you, you mentioned parking. Is the only order to prescribe parking requirement 1.2 space per unit on the master plan. The, the master plan talks about parking for office and considers that parking in close proximity to metro should do parking reduction. It talks about parking for residential it should also consider it. Um, anything that did not, and of course the zoning ordinance requires a parking reduction request, which is a separate application the board of supervisors typically process with any type of zoning application. So if, if the developer wants to reduce the amount of parking spaces, they would typically have to ask for that and provide the reasoning behind it now. The kind of plan encourages that when you're in close proximity to Metro that you don't park at, you park at a lower rate. But my concern is that we're not following the master plan. If you follow the master plan, and when you make a condo, you allow 1.2, which I think is pretty low, but that's the master plan for residential development. And that we don't tear all the trees down when we're building and put in little um, evergreens. And that we allow for the open spaces we need to off, which are in the master plan to offset the density. And I would like to see, if we follow that, I think, will be in better shape and I would like to see um, there not be no exceptions. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Homer. I'm a new resident of Reston. I bought a house on Lake Thoreau about a year ago. And I have read the entire master plan uh, proposal and I've read the summary that you have on the website. And when I hear uh, you saying that there is no change, that everything is going to be the same as it was before under um, the original rest and plan, I have to say that that is just not so. Um, we are proposing a zoning amendment to allow increased density. And the only places um, in the PRC that you're changing are, there's a, a spot in, um, along Reston County Parkway and there's the shopping centers. So obviously you are planning an increase in, uh, in, in those areas. So I, you know, I think it's 
there's, been a t there's a tendency in this to minimize what you're doing, but you're going to almost double the current population of breast and with this result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of making the presentation and asking the question, but I will get to the question. Um, for Lake Thoreau, we now have 600 dwelling units around the lake, and that includes the condos that are right next to the South Lake Center, and it includes the uh, senior housing that's on the other side of South Lakes. Um, you're planning on adding 724 more housing units. So that will more than double the current population that has access to our lake, which is going to run down our property values and lead to overuse. So my question is, um, in light of all this, in what way are you taking into account the interests of the existing residents, our home values, our quality of life? In this yeah. Now that you're planning to make some changes 
is there a similar economic analysis that you should describe some of the benefits of what you're doing besides the steady values, but actually the hard cents and dollars? If you don't, can't speak to the economic benefits, can you at least speak to the economic downsides that would happen if we don't make this amendment? Yeah. Quite frankly, I'm not aware of any economic analysis that was done when the rest of the master plan was originally created. Oh. Uh, I think the Vegas one is approved. The Vegas one is your plan to get anybody money. But I can say that one of the things that, that we as a county do, the largest investment in transit in this area is the metro. And one of the things that, that helps the metro system function is to have people there who can ride it, who are convenient, have that convenient access to Metro. And that was one of the underpinnings of the master plan. And I can tell you, the rest of the market area is one of the few areas in the county where we have not had the high vacancy rates in terms of office space that we've had elsewhere. And it's because it is an attractive market for employers to be located. It's obviously an attractive place for people who live. Not only the people who live in existing homes, but also people who, are, who want to buy and rent in some of the newer homes that are being created and rest. So I don't think that there's um, a, a deficit in economic value being created or economic potential in rest. I think just the opposite. I think the facts speak for themselves with that regard. Just to say, I would, I would echo the Melania sentiment that said you speak very much to the economic benefit of newcomers because they have no place to live, but you're not addressing what the economic benefits are to the people who are already here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Steve Moore. <coughs> Sorry, I was a little late tonight, uh, as was uh, my wife. Uh, we spent a combined seven hours in traffic today. Uh, I tried to come down the toll road, there's an accident. Uh, I got off at um, uh, uh, Wolf Trap, took fuel up, that was jammed up. I went down to Vienna, that was jammed up. So, yeah, so we spent uh, seven hours with my wife. I advised her to come through uh, 123, kind of was jammed up. So you said that the solutions follow development. Well, we got plenty of problems where you can focus your, your energies and fix those. Another comment was we would get retail out of this. Um, does anybody here want more retail? No. So my question for you is, uh, earlier I heard that you would take our wishes into consideration. I'd like to know why that's not the main consideration and why we don't want it why it would go forward, uh, you know, the sprawl is continuing, and where is this all taking us except for gridlock and, and just cementing up the whole place? So, I was hoping to get an that, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. I'll answer the best way I can, and that is, we haven't adopted plans for rest of If that plan went through a community process, and I don't know how many people here were a part of that process or not, but I can tell you, there were people in rest who supported that change. And I would invite you... Reopen it. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. Have a vote. I don't know that a lot has changed in the three, in the two and a half years since that plan was adopted. Uh, but I, but I, I can say that it did go through a public process. It does represent the views of some in the rest of the community. It may not be the people that have heard. Have you done any uh, polling to get like some? Percentage numbers on that when you say it represents some, is that, I mean, do you have any idea what that proportion might be? Who's in favor of development versus not? No. 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 So I think, I think you guys should stop all activity if you know exactly what that proportion is. Thank you. 
membership of the Western Massachusetts. I'm changing my, my talk here to answer this last thing that Mr. Sullivan said. The rest of the master plan special study has a task force membership. It was 24 people. It lists five of 16 as being on a planning and zoning committee. Well, they did not represent the planning and zoning committee. I'm a member of almost 40 years on the committee, and it sure doesn't represent my. JBG companies. Yeah. 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 Which is worth today's stock market four point three two billion dollars. <laughs> One of their companies is Monado. Stephen Roth is a friend of Mr. Bush. Stephen Roth has a, has a value. His personal wealth is one point oh eight million. I think that's more than any, the whole community here. And that's who you listen to. <laughs> Building. Yeah. Building. All right, from your master plan, you say here, it's a flawed plan. If you knew what you could build in the, in the shopping centers, why in the world did you rezone the density around the metro stations and really congest our streets? And I'll get to that. But let me read from your plan here. The purpose of the network analysis, as directed by the Board of Supervisors, we have one member here, is to evaluate the conceptual grid, grids of streets and road elements at gateways to the rest and transit station areas, which result in traffic flowing and acceptable conditions. Does anyone think they're acceptable conditions? No. Maintaining a walkable grids of streets. Are you kidding? Look at that metal. Just any piece of street, those grid streets. You can call a pig a sow, <laughs> but that's not a grid of streets. <laughs> Why transportation improvements? The sidewalk. You want to listen to me or talk? <laughs> Great Meadow and Willie Avenue. On the south side, there's no sidewalk. The signal is at Willie Avenue. Metro opened in July of 2014. There's still no sidewalk there. That's not a $50 project. Sir, do you have a direct question? <laughs> Supervisors adopted is a level E. That's only for urban centers, not for suburban communities like it says here in your master plan. The, level, the streets around the metro are already operating at a level of service E. What is a level of service E? It is average delay between 50 and 85 seconds. So they're probably operating maybe 50 people, the consultants for the developers. But with the developers, they will still be a level E. Yeah, but 80 seconds. What's 80 seconds? That's a lot of time. That's only one signal. Just multiply that by the number of people here and think of the time loss and the money loss for congestion. <laughs> So let, 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 me, let me ask the question, why, why do you allow a level of service of E? So what do all the say that's not good? Level of service E applies only in the transit station areas, so the more or less areas surrounded by Sunrise Valley Drive. It's Sunset not Hills. urban, like that traffic stays there? The only people who live there? Okay, go ahead. So it applies in the urban areas surrounding the Metro Rail Station. And the reason why level of service E was identified is because it's hard to strike a balance between vehicular traffic and the ability for people to cross the street. So every improvement of 10 to 15 seconds means that we have to put another lane on a roadway. So Reston Parkway is already six lanes. If we wanted to operate at level of service D or C, Reston Parkway is going to need to be eight, 
10 lanes wide, and no one's going to be able to cross that. So level of service need is a balance. It really is a balance between the ability for people to safely cross streets, to create an urban atmosphere around our metro rail station, but still give people a relatively reasonable amount of space to the That's pure, that's pure <laughs> And now, our neighbor is right here. At, at, the, at the Bernardo property, I had a proposal to get the right of way for the Bernardo property on Sunrise Valley. That we can get an extra lane. No cost to us. No. It also now, the development is coming off on the other side of the street, where you can also add an extra lane. It's not shown in the plan they have just submitted to the planning committee. But what you're saying is a complete farce. It's a lie, because the report, the original report from staff that by the applicant, Bonato, to build, but was changed by somebody, maybe Mr. Selden, maybe someone got it in, but somebody changed that report, and to me that is plain fraud, because he left the original, I, I'll testify that, <laughs> under, under oath, and you too, and, and your staff, and it happens all the time in the county, it's changed by somebody, and it's demoralizing to the staff, and it's, if somebody's taking money, that's corruption. And just in case you don't know who I am, I worked 50 years as a traffic engineer for different cities, counties, states, and the federal government. I'm a professional engineer with a graduate degree in transportation from Yale University. I think I know what I'm talking about. I'm a construction inspector, so I'm going to be speaking against my own uh, profession. <laughs> Supervisor Hutchins, what is the true reason for artificially inflating the population of Reston? <laughs> Thank you. 
but I found her always kept the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance, and I've followed land use and development issues for the last 25 years in Fairfax County. I've been involved in the Tyson's master plan process as well as in Raston. And for the benefit of the 600 plus people, I don't know if people at home can see how many people are here, but basically, it isn't just Reston alone. We're facing a massive amount of new approved development from Tyson's to the Route 28 corridor. And the impacts of these different communities, they interact upon each other. So for instance, in Tyson's, with the 100 million plus approved development, and let's say there's 30, 40 million square feet there today, one of the transportation planners with Fairfax County showed in 2009 you would need a couple of additional lanes on the toll road between Tyson's and Wheely Avenue, which according to the strip map that I saw in 2009, would take out part of Wolf Trap. Our planners have been very, very quiet on this matter for at least five years. So the bottom line is that it isn't just going doubling the size of Reston, it's the doubling of Tyson's, it's the doubling of Herndon, it's the doubling of the 28 corridor. So I would have gone to over 100 meetings in the Reston master plan process and then the uh, transit, the, the road network grid process. And back in the end of March, I asked Kirsten a question. When are you going to study the impact of the additional traffic on the Dulles toll road on the, on the intersections in Reston? And she said, well, we're just starting to look at that. And that was the end of March. Okay. I never heard any more about it. Uh, and, and in the same time frame, I asked Tom Bershadden, the director of the County Transportation Department, what new improvements are, going, are we going to see in Reston, highway improvements, in the next decade? Because he was forced to admit that the soapstone connector couldn't be built before 2026. <laughs> and in particular, I asked him about the improvements to Sun, Sun, Sunset Hills Road, which of course you know is a windy two-lane road. And I never have received any, and now very important for the public here, right now is an opportunity for you to have input because the county is doing what it calls the update to its transportation priorities process. And I hope before we leave the meeting that somebody will give us the specific uh, link so that we know where to go. I think the process is, is going on. There's a meeting I think next Monday, I'm not sure where it is, or maybe it's the 30th, I don't know what the date is today. But the bottom line is you have a chance to tell the county in terms of highway improvements what you want to see in the rest of the area. Because right now, nothing's being done. And yes, they're working. Kirsten may say we have plenty of staff working. What do you see bill being built? Absolutely nothing. What has been approved and funded? Absolutely nothing. And so here we are proposing millions and millions of square feet without a single lane improvement funded and going to construction within the next five years. What well, I would suggest is that you have a moratorium for one year, a new development plan for a vault, come back to the rest of the community with the facts and the funding. The last time Fairfax County had a significant highway uh, bond issue was at least 10 years ago. We've had two or three for the Metro, Metro Matters. The last bond issue I think was 2014 and out of 100 million, 85 million went to bike and pedestrian trails. And so what are we getting in highways in the rest of the area? Absolutely nothing. Now, on the school issue, uh, I went to public hearings last year in the, the Board of Supervisors they approved what are called urban schools and they refused to set a recreational space for a student standard. So what kind of schools are we trying? So I could go on and on and on. So the bottom line is you need to get a community group together to work with people like Walter who's in the back here. Uh, Walter Alcorn lives in Reston and so he's a former planning commissioner. He has a good sense of judgment, he worked on the Tyson's plan, he worked with people of different points of view. You've got to get us together, so instead of seeing all these yellow shirts, you see green shirts. Thank you.
Um, good evening, my name is Caitlin. I um, get to live kind of the Robert E. Simon dream. I live, work, and play in Reston. I grew up here. My husband and I live just uh, next to North Point, and I work as a social worker at the Cameron Glen building right across the street from your office, ma'am. Um, my question has to do with services to the citizens as the Reston continues to grow, regardless of whether or not this increase is approved. You're talking about possibly redeveloping the village centers. Well, that brings a loss, to at the very least temporarily, of restaurants, grocery stores. I stop by the giant grocery store at least twice a week to get something I forgot on the weekend. Um, so you're talking about losing that. You're also talking about continuing to stretch thin our current Department of Human Services. As a social worker, I have already, if I were a single woman, I couldn't live in Reston. Uh, I'm overworked, underpaid. My husband and I would very much like to start and raise a family here in Reston, but he gets home at 7 o'clock at night after riding the lovely metro, and I work usually till about 9 o'clock at night, just as due course of my work. So what is the plan? I've heard about transportation, but what is the plan to ensure that the citizens who are here and the citizens you would like to add have the appropriate level of service in restaurants and shops and stores, but also with human services? There's a companion effort that's looking at what's called Reston Town Southern North area. And that area, there's significant county facilities there now, and they are looking at how that area might redevelop and you integrate those facilities with new development, such as integrating the shelter and the library with new development, creating opportunities for office space for human services and other types of um, services for the general community at large. Yeah, I've actually been to a lot of the, the one meeting I think that was had so far. There might have been two and I had to miss one. But there, with redeveloping the physical space, which is desperately needed because our building is very old, um, you also have to think about increased staffing, increase in, you know, keeping up with the pay that your staffers get as the cost goes up to live here. I didn't get a market rate adjustment this past fiscal year uh, when it came time to, to look at that. The county denied us that because there wasn't sufficient funding for it. And yet you would like to stretch us even thinner. And I'm concerned about that. You know, we're, we're doing everything we can to encourage, encourage future development that meets the needs of both the existing residents as well as future residents. Every time a development proposal goes in, we kind of look at well, what, what could happen here that could benefit the broader community and not just look at what's happening. But again, it's, it's a complicated process with, that takes years to build out. But the plan does talk about and recognize the need to have those kind of social services, to have community facilities, to have places for people to shop, people to recreate, uh, and, people to be, and places for people to be educated. But again, going, going forward, it's, it's much more challenging than it was originally. What was done is there was a lot of land. So really, when you look at community facilities, Rest of they just said, okay, well, we'll put a school here and we'll put a church here. Um, but again, they had the, the land and the ability to kind of do that. Now, we're, we're facing an opportunity where most of the land is dedicated to some use, so it does have to be redeveloped. Like Cameron Glen is a dedicated facility. The question is how you can redevelop that facility and still meet some of the needs that Cameron Glen met but also other needs that may be possible. But again, when people talk about, well, we don't want any more density, you're not going to have redevelopment without some additional density. It, it doesn't. The only time I know of redevelopment that happens when you don't have density is when it gets to a point where you have a use that is so depressed that it becomes vacant. And, and again, you have devaluation of property. 
That's not the case in wrestling. Uh, I'm not sure. Once again. All right. Uh, one quick thing before we go. Uh, next time, if we hold a meeting like this, you might want to figure out some ways so people don't have to stand up for an hour or so at a time while we can talk. Maybe like break your email or anything like that. Just saying, you know, I'm feeling surprised. Not everyone else can do this. It's hard. Um, so I'm going to time myself because otherwise I'll go too long. Um, so I'm going to rant a little bit and then ask a question. So quickly, you divide your responsibilities. Um, so my biggest concern, I am not wholly unopposed to having more housing in Reston. As young homeowners, we very recently purchased a house here. It was kind of expensive. We are basically the only people of our high school class I can think of that live in Reston. Most of them have left because it is way too expensive. So that sort of rolls into the question. I'll get to it later. Um, quick couple of notes. The public transportation system right now is not terrible, but it's not great. The bus stop near my house currently is not ADA accessible. It doesn't have a sidewalk. It is literally a sign in a patch of grass hundreds of feet from any sort of sidewalk. It's hard for me to get there in the morning. It's kind of a pain. The other thing is, is we talk about, oh, you know, this will improve Metro, this will improve Metro. My commute is an hour and a half each way from North Point to the State Department every day. I go from uh, from my house to Reston to the State Department, which is Foggy Bottom, my first stop in DC. It is an hour and a half on a good day. It was two hours and a half, two and a half hours this morning. So the biggest problem is when you talk about any sort of metro improvements like that, the main problem with metro doesn't reside in Fairfax County. We have no control over that. It's the Roslyn Tunnel, and everything we do interacts with that tunnel. So you can talk about how, oh, you know, people just use metro, people just use metro. It's already extremely crowded during commute hours. The problem is no one uses it when they're not commuting because it's a commuter rail. No one's really going into the city to do anything because we have all these lovely services here in Reston. It's great. That's why we live here. Um, so my real big issue with that is just it's not addressing the core issue of Metro's problem is a bottleneck at Alexandria slash Arlington and not really a bottleneck here. There's plenty of space for trains to go on the Silver Line. It's not really that bad, but as soon as you get to the Orange Silver Blue Line, forget about it. Um, so that's that. Um, core question that I wanted to ask about. So we talked about all this new development. Once again, not unopposed. However, I do think that a lot of the planning is suspect. That schools, the services, everything else like that seems very nebulous. But we have all this concrete numbers for how many homes. It seems kind of weird. But the real question is, how many of these are going to be people, uh, homes people can actually afford to live in? Because, I mean, we have all these lovely apartments being built in Tyson's and Alexandria and stuff. And my wife and I look at them, and they're completely unaffordable. Like, you just forget about it. So what are we doing in this sort of plan? Or is there anything where we just kind of throw up our hands and say, yeah, about ensuring people who make, say, a combined income of under, let's just say 80, 80 a year, you know, combined income or single, single house income, are able to afford to live and rest in without spending more than half their salary on their mortgage or the second crisis is my generation just my student debt. That's yes. basically it. It's right. one and two. Yes. So that's it. I was on four minutes. <laughs> yeah. the, the rest of the master plan I have guys talk about affordable housing. I have to make some recommendation at a minimum that you have twelve percent of the units be affordable to all workforce development unit. That, that's twelve percent as the Density increases, this is sliding scale. So if you're at an FAR a one floor ratio, it would be at 12%. If you go up to a four, you're at 20% affordable housing. So it's a sliding scale on that, where you are on the ratio. So of the applications we received today, you know, all the residential ones have had some affordability component with them. So uh, have we run the numbers how many people apply for affordable housing? currently and how many units are going to be added if we'll even meet that demand. And then also, you know, we talked about the definition of affordable housing as far as the law goes. It's the same as the poverty line. It's a fun idea, but it doesn't really represent the poverty line. Like $18,000 around here, ain't gonna get you anything. 
So as far as affordable housing goes, I'm, you know, the, the, the legal minimum is great, but I'm also talking about is it just going to be those legal minimum apply through the county housing, you know, housing and then 80% luxury condos that no one around here can afford? Or is it going to be more like those minimum, you know, meet the county requirements and then, you know, some actual affordable housing that you don't have to apply for and things like that? And then actually, you know, a couple of luxury
we do have still a line, so those of you please post your question so we can get as many as we can to 925. I'll try to make this fast. Uh, I moved to Reston 20 years ago because it's a beautiful community. The trees, the open green spaces, the lakes, the bike paths, and the golf courses. Now, Reston fought a long, hard battle to save its public golf course um, it just recently. <laughs> up to the Hidden Creek Country Club, uh, to that golf course. It is our understanding that that golf course is very quietly uh, being sold to developers. I'd like to know, number one, if in fact it is in the process of being sold, number two, to whom it's being sold, and number three, what are the plans for development of that property? and it will devalue all of the properties around that golf course, and we are not happy about this. Please comment. Thank you. Plan that was adopted in 2015 did, was an explicit call of golf courses as planned for golf courses, and to remain as golf courses. That, that was reinforced. I have no knowledge of what, what may happen in terms of property ownership. Right? Well, I would think that it is your job to find out what is happening to the Green Country Club and what kind of development uh, will be taking place on that land. Well, again, I can only speak to what kind of development can occur. It's planned for a golf course. Somebody wants to develop it in some other fashion. They either have two options. They have to prove that they have some kind of property rights to build, or they have to come in and request a change to the conference plan. Those are the two options that I know of. I want to make the community aware that this is going on, and we need to keep on top of this. Thank you. in 20 years. I'm going to start by making a few comments on behalf of a friend who's not able to stand and wait for her chance to comment. And so I wanted to say that we've seen in Reston our quality of life has already suffered. And many of us were not involved at a point when decisions were made in the past that have allowed things to reach the point that we are at today. And uh, we heard a gentleman say that there are three developments that have already been approved that will take us up to the 13th uh, ceiling. And so that suggests to me that this process is developer driven. That because developers are pushing for an increase. Now, I who live here and rely on Reston for our quality of life are pushing for this increase. <laughs> I've heard talk that in the process of redevelopment that gathering space will be considered and included in all the plans, particularly as it relates to village centers. And uh, I wanted to say that, of course, gathering space is vital to community life. And we now are in a place where Reston Town Center is a town center in name only because we know that citizens do not have a public forum at Reston Town Center where we can exercise our right to free speech, our constitutional right to be heard. And we know that even though uh, we can maybe get petitions signed at Lake Ann, thankful to, thanks to the merchants who have allowed it there, if we try to get petitions signed outside the rest of Metro Station, we are not allowed. We are told we are trespassing on private land uh, at rest of town center. The retailers keep us out as trespassers when we try to be heard in our rest of town center. So I wanted to ask what our elected officials, like you, Supervisor Hudgens, are doing to ensure that there is a proper made, if there's any development, there should be a proper for public forum space where people can be heard. My name is 
So we're talking about 6,245 acres. That is the area that is zoned PRC and that is subject to the 13 persons per acre limitation. And to, to answer the question, this amendment to the zoning ordinance wouldn't change the population. It would merely allow for development to be requested. It doesn't approve it. <laughs> What is the acreage number he wants to know? 6,245. On the bike! And if you take it to 16, it's got to be another 20,000. <laughs> three times, three times, two times that, seven to 21,000. All right. The acreage, the acreage you quote, that would allow a total population presence of 81,185 people, and all of Reston today comprises, according to the last census, about 58,400 As I said, it's too crude a tool, and you haven't answered fundamental questions. And I think I just proved it. Yes, I, have a, I, I want to thank you for having this um, rescheduled hearing because a lot of people are not comfortable with what you're doing. So I have a, an observation and a three part question. The observation is, I think you're meeting your own talking points too much. You've got to step back and listen to the people. First question, when does Fairfax County plan to schedule public hearings before the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission? And in light of what you've heard tonight, doesn't it make sense to push that off sometime in the far distant future? Part B, you talked about the benefit of the community a lot, the rest of the plan, and how these plans are going to benefit the community. Do any of you live in any of the village centers here in Reston and experience the joy of trying to commute to the Lily Metro stop in the morning or get home at night or just get over the Lily Metro Bridge? If you do, please raise your hand and educate us because we think you don't and you don't get it. And the good part, the why is it so hard for you all, who are dedicated public servants, to serve the community, to stand in our shoes and experience and to hear our agony of Western plan, no Western plan? The village sectors and the increase in density that you cite for the village sectors, nobody had no idea. 15, 20 years ago when that was recorded in the, in, the, in the train. So I would ask all those people here in the audience tonight who think this is not a good idea to stand up and raise your hands these people who pay attention to the people who pay their salaries and are supposed to represent them. Regarding the uh, potential increase for density of the village side, the reason that we're advertising a range of the number to potentially increase the density to is so that we can consider options in between. So we hear that there is a, a great deal of concern about the issue of, again, accommodating future density in the village centers, and we are taking that into consideration. The second point was just about the question about the schedule of the public hearings. We do not have a firm date schedule yet, and so it is possible that additional um, time or information may uh, be appropriate in that. But what we were looking at uh, previously, remember when we rescheduled this meeting, we said that none of the public hearings would be planned. 
happen any sooner from the, this meeting than we had planned. Um, so originally we had planned to get the, um, and the way it works, to have to schedule the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors public hearings requires going to the board to get authorization to advertise those public hearings, and then we hold the public hearings. Um, so we were looking at potentially going to the board either at the end of the year or the beginning of January uh, to get authorizations to schedule those public hearings. And then those would be scheduled either later in January or early February for the Planning Commission, and later in February or early in March for the Board of Supervisors. But again, those are not scheduled, that's just tentative, but that is the current thought. Yes, ma'am. My name is Patty Vince, and I'm a 27 year resident of Reston, also the member of Refining Reston, and please listen carefully to what I have to say completely different from a little off the track of what you were receiving. So I support everything what people have said. There was a recent Dish Now article covered a conference at a long, attended by a large number of developers who collectively came to the conclusion that I quote, further demand for residents and residents will be weak at best for the foreseeable future. Why in the world do you have people in this room wanting to approve this when you have developers saying that, hey, Put a cap on it. It's already overflowing. If you haven't read Supervisor Hunt's article in the October Rested Magazine, please do so. I find it very deceptive. This is what she said. To refresh your memory, in 1962, the value of the person per acre was 11 and modified seven years later in 1969 to come to 13. What she doesn't tell you is we are not even at 13. Not only are we not at 13, we are not at 12. And it's 48 years later. Why in the world do we need something to go on the table now? What is the urgency? There's plenty of time to do it. Specific projects. 
the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority has a specific tax that uh, is levied upon Northern Virginia as a whole. It's, it's a commercial tax on um, sales and I think on uh, housing closures when you, when you sell your home. That um, is also used in one of the big sources that we're looking at for funding. Um, and we haven't ruled out the opportunities as an appropriate federal source. So we're really creating a tiered approach to how we fund the improvements in Reston, both from Reston at a county, state, and federal level. So if I may summarize, you don't know where you're getting the funding. However, <laughs> you do know there's a very real possibility that at least some of it come from taxes imposed purely solely on the residents of rest. On the transit station areas, which are the areas of growth and development, specifically around the three metro rail stations, they do not. Okay, uh, one other comment. Um, I was a member of the Robo Planning and Zoning Commission for about 10 years in the 80s. At that time, we still had developers. And I recall that we were specifically told by a representative of the rest of Land Corporation, which was then a mobile subsidiary, that the maximum plan population rested was 65,000. I heard one of your numbers say 78 earlier. The difference between those two numbers is material. What is material is that this is so far beyond what was originally planned for the rest of it, that I find the implication in the statement I heard earlier before the uh, question period, that this is consistent with Robert Simon's vision, I find that blasphemous. Thank you. Listening to the initial presentations, 
um, there seemed to be a sense that there was an attempt to reassure everyone that this is all going to be okay and that there weren't any problems, there weren't really any changes happening. Um, and yet, it just seems like that's a story that's been told before. Um, and it really hasn't worked out that way. Um, and finally, I was also particularly struck by the comment um, that was made at one point, I believe, I'm not sure I remember which person made it, but that, uh, that the development was, was coming because Metro didn't have enough ridership and you needed to provide that ridership. <laughs> now, um, as a long-time opponent of Metro, I, I was in the minority at that time, maybe I still am, but um, it just seems like that's crazy. And just as a sort of proof of concept of, of what I'm thinking, is it not true that the boulevard building, right at the real metro station, is still two years after the metro station was open, more like two and a half years, is still looking for occupants? It's not fully sold yet. Yeah, right. So, I mean, um, finally, one last comment. Um, a friend of mine has a sign in his place of work that says something to the effect of, if something seems confusing to you, look for the economic reasons for it. <laughs> Please, if you have a question that probably has not been asked before, I would ask that you know that we refer to those folks um, and be as concise and as possible so we can get as many people in because 9:25, I need to have Supervisor Hudgens close. We have to be out of the building. Okay, I'm trying not to So I just moved here, unlike a lot of people who have been asking questions. Um, and we just purchased the house. And I have to say before I ask a question that traffic patterns in the area did weigh heavily on our decision on where to buy a house. It, just driving around during rush hour, and I thought this is absolutely ridiculous. We were, there's no way we're going to live over here and work over here. And, anyway. Okay, so my question. So I've heard a lot of talk about the metro stations themselves and how it's a great investment in infrastructure. And I understand that building up those areas um, is important for various reasons. But I'm concerned about the development of the village centers themselves because they're very far from the metro centers. And so in order for people to get from their dwelling places in the village centers to the metro stations, they will probably drive their cars. Right. I'm guessing. Because right now, so I, I don't drive as often as probably a lot of people in here do. I take the bus a lot. And the bus doesn't come that often. So what are, are there specific plans to increase public transit between the village centers and the metro stations? And even from village center to village center. Because so say I live in the Scottsdale Village Center and I take the bus to the metro, other hours, I'm going to be driving around on the streets to do other stuff, right? I mean, or, or are they? Or are we just assuming that everyone in the middle center is going to walk everywhere? It's a good question. So right now, there's no plans that we have imminently for the village centers to redevelop. But if there was a node of people, Wait, so if there's not, then what? I don't understand, but I'm confused. So if there are no plans to redevelop the village there's no, there's, I guess I, I'm not in our applications department, so okay. there's not a rezoning application. It's in the plan, but there's nothing in well, the right. rezoning. Right, it's not being rezoned because we already heard that earlier. That right, so kept the same, but if, development it, is what if and when a rezoning application were to come in and... Wait, it doesn't need to be rezoned. I'm confused. It, it, would, it would need to be rezoned, because right now it's already planned. Oh. But it's zoned for residential. Tall Oaks. Didn't we hear earlier that it was zoned for development for residential properties? You did, but to exercise it's zoned, but to exercise the zoning, you have to come in with what's called a PRC plan or a development plan. Okay. And that development plan is reviewed by the community and it has to be developed in, in, in consultation with the broader community. And that's but why it doesn't have to be rezoned. It doesn't have to be rezoned. Okay, sorry, I don't the PRC. But sorry, back to the my, my main question. Let me answer that Again, that answer only applies to the building centers which are zoned in the BRC. Wait, but I guess my question was about transportation. Forget my 
not the AR land use okay. rezoning letters. So if increased density were to be realized at those locations, our transit department looks at kind of where the nodes of people are who want to ride buses. When the Wheelie Metro Station was open, we redid the ribs routes to better serve the Wheelie Metro Station. We're going to do the same when Weston Station and Hearth had open. So we're going to reuse the same amount of buses to better move people within Reston because we won't be going to just one station anymore. And if we're to see development happen in areas that create kind of nodes, because you do need a, a, an amount of riders to make a bus work. If you have more people, you can run more frequent service. Um, so yes, if we were to see significant increases in density at some of those locations, we, our transit group would probably start to look at if it would make sense to add another bus to reduce the headways from say half an hour. But in the meantime, they would be driving their cars because there wouldn't be enough transit service provided at the appropriate time. We, the, the RIPS service is actually a pretty substantial service. It does serve the residential neighborhoods of Reston. I've seen people on it at Lake Camp before. Um, it's one of our more um, successful neighborhood circulation services, and it's going to get more permit or It'll go into the neighborhoods better with the opening of the next two Silver Line stations because we'll no longer be focusing on Wheelie, and we'll be able to more directly serve the neighborhoods that are closer to those metro rail stations. Okay, just real quick, is there any thought of a rest and circulator that goes from like Village Center to Village Center, both ways, both one way and the other way? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll take it out. Yes, Hi, my name is Cheryl Resky, and I'm a new homeowner to the rest of the last two and a half, three years. I'm from Central, which I'm from Texas. I know all about rest and I planned to move to rest when I was younger, I just couldn't afford it. Now that I'm older, I can afford it. Me and my husband live here, we bike to work just about every day. We don't bike around the metro. We don't drive anymore because of the traffic. We moved to Reston because of the green space. And because of the town center. And because of Trader Joe's. my community fight for the golf course that we live on because that's another reason we moved to Reston. The Reston National Golf Course that was, a, that was a fight for that that we won, thank God. For now. For now. But because this high density that you guys are talking about, the rezone is not going to affect, which already has affected. You've moved in some townhomes across from Indian Ridge. <coughs> Eight hundred thousand dollar townhomes which are about to be a million dollars because the base price is 800. And then you're putting a condominium in front of the town. Now who wants to live in a house with a condominium right in front of it? I'm sorry, I, I look at you and I'm really disappointed.
called Lakefront in the middle of the village center by the shopping center, which has an incredible community. Um, just about 100 in every single afternoon, you come to the middle school and the middle school, so making sure they're down to the shopping center and they're on the way to the middle school. And then we're moving to the same community. We have some of those fireworks shows that are on the way. We have a concert put on the way. Here's the way we disparage those little things that are not doing what they're supposed to do. So we chill down and find the time. Someone who's creating this image for us so that we no idea what they went to school to do and what they did work. And that's a problem. Um, I love it. 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 And I thought the question about why you want us potentially stuff 81,000 people in the community with the community of the department is a really good one that we brought in. Um, what, I, what I have to ask uh, is what we have to do to, to justify the fee that it has to do to fulfill the national program. And since the national program has to change the way of writing to the students who are losses, because the democratic process, the democratic process needs to not make changes to policy or the law that are proportionate to the existing regime in today. What do we have to do to reopen the national government? Do we have to test ourselves to find the changes we are trying to drive in order to fulfill the national plan people want to support? And when we reopen the national So we do not have these holes within our community that are wild west and are not responsive to the desire of the needs of the people who actually live. So how can we do that? What is the process? What is the process? process that uh, sets forth a periodic review of areas of account. This plan was adopted in 2015 and it is eligible to be considered in 2020. Right. Because there's typically a five-year period after a plan has been adopted, a five-year period um, to allow that plan uh, to be implemented. But we don't want it implemented, so what can we do to reopen it so that it gets appropriate community oversight. Yeah! Quite frankly, I 
I'm applauding the people that have been considered of others and they've come to try to ask civil questions of themselves. And quite frankly, the only thing that has said today that truly upset me was somebody who said that somehow our motives are being driven by bribes or some other type of sort of Greed. That, that, that is different from what people like to see as greed. That was a personal attack on the staff. Mm -hmm. right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Now, I Professor Hunted, Representative, he said the process is to make an appeal to the Board of Supervisors to be open to that thing. People are representative. If you don't the process, you Important in wrestling, and employers are important in wrestling. Okay. So, again, I understand. So, you have residents such as myself, you have developers or property owners. Okay. Um, so, in this process of, you know, when developers come in, or property owners come in, want to make a change, they want to increase the redevelopment area, again, those are all open hearings. Is that correct? Yes, they are. Okay. So, during those hearings,
lot of confusing information that's been provided. And I, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I've been pleased to sit through and hear the concerns. I want to tell you that when you have listened to these folks, I, I feel concerned to say that Bob Simon was a developer, and Bob Simon developed the plan that they are implementing. And it's not, wait, 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 wait hear, excuse me, hear, hear me, hear me out, and I will describe, I will explain why I said his plan. And if you, and I will give you a copy of what it talks about. While it's technical in, in, in the language that you've heard today, the staff is simply saying they're trying to implement the plan as it started, the numbers that are there. And because there was a comprehensive plan change beginning of uh, 2014, and that the numbers were not adjusted, which is what they were to do, and what was done the last <laughs> time. That's why this proposal is here. I under, excuse me, excuse me, I really did listen to you a lot more than some of the other people had time to say it and got a lot. I think it, the, the, I think what I hear is the concern and the frustration of what does it, what does growth rest and feel like? And whether or not, and I'm going to ask this question, whether or not who here is welcome to come back into rest? And if so, how? And that is a question. Is it only the house that I move out of that says you're welcome to yeah. And if it's a yes to that, that means that no growth comes to rest. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You, if that's what you believe, it is not Bob Simon's dream that you're talking about. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm sorry I asked it that way. I asked it that way because of the decision making. I want to listen and hear your views. I want to make certain that we do the right thing with any kind of change that we make. But I asked you, I asked you to ask yourself what it is that you Want. You have up. Uh, I thought we told you. Yeah, I'm sure we were correct. You know, I, 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 I know this was going to be hard, and we really do have to be out of here. And so I'm going to just try and say this as best I can. Because I really, really want to think about what kind of person we are. And I've been here 48 years. And it was a place that said, hello, you're welcome. Please come. Let's work together. You, 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 it's been a place to say, how do we work together? to solve our problems. And so that's the goal that I have. And I'm willing to hear the concerns. I'm willing to talk about how to mitigate the concerns. And I want to work with you to do that. But I, no, I have to how, you know, how I, we, we have talked about those things. When we said, when, when we say there are transportation issues, when we say there are going to be school issues, we, when we talk about density numbers, we can talk about those numbers. But I will tell you, I feel more than you think. Because uh, I'm going to tell you, my, I, I, I came to listen, and I think I should have a. It isn't about reads with me. It's who we all can listen to. You represent. 
say 